So hi, uh, I'm Fabian Mulberg, and I'm going to switch topic by half a sentence and still talk about gradual typing. So if you're new to the session and gradual typing, um, oops, this needs to be on. Um, so if you're new to um, the session on gradual typing, um, here's the short version. When we talk about type sound languages, we typically think about them being either statically type checked or having dynamic type checking. And the idea of gradual typing is to have both of them in the same language such that we can choose which one we want to use for uh, different parts of our program. Now one way to think about gradual uh, static type checking is that um, it is a very meticulous person. And gradual typing kind of puts them in an odd couple by giving them a slightly more relaxed roommate. Now we want these two to be friends, but static type systems rely heavily on certain invariants being in place. And so for sound gradual typing, we need to enforce these invariants with runtime checks. Now a typical perspective on gradual typing is that we want to add it to an existing language. And often these languages are dynamically typed. To understand this talk, it's important to understand that our perspective is different. We care about designing a language where gradual typing is an equal member from the start. So you can consider interactions between gradual typing and the rest of the language and weigh that into the design process. The advantage of that is that we are not constrained by existing legacy stuff and it enables us to co-design all the components of our system. So this may not help with existing languages, although it may provide some insights, but it definitely helps with designing new languages. So in co-design, we start with some features that we want our language to have, and that informs us what we need to implement. On the other hand, we know how to implement some things efficiently, and we know that some things we can't really implement efficiently. And that informs us how, what type of system features should be more prominent parts of our language, and which type of system features we may need to restrict somewhat. And that way, we get uh, an efficient language. Now, when we combine multiple type system features, especially also gradual typing, um, then we might also need to um, co-design them with each other on their own to get predictable semantics. And so using this approach, we designed NOM, a gradually typed nominal object-oriented language. This is a very simplistic language because its point is just to demonstrate the viability of this research direction. Now, we give, um, we give evidence that it is efficient, especially compared to previous results on record and reticulated Python. And it, has uh, and it has predictable semantics, especially as opposed to C sharp, which we'll get into. Now, in design, there's always some trade-offs, and the trade-offs that we made here are related um, to expressivity. Um, these prevent the language to be used in the more traditional style of adding gradual typing to an existing dynamically typed language. Um, but, there's, but the trade-offs are still reasonable in the face of a number of applications that we'll go into shortly. Uh, in the future, we hope to address some of these trade-offs through more advanced techniques, but for now, we'll just go and survey this research direction and see what advantages and disadvantages we get. So let's start with the most controversial aspect of our work, which is that we intentionally sacrifice some expressivity and yet still claim that we have a useful gradual type system. This is because we are working with a different set of assumptions and target uh, a different set of applications. The first assumption is that most code in our language is typed. This makes sense in a number of applications. The first of which is education, where it's useful to have standard libraries um, that are typed for IDE support, for documentation, and for error reporting. But it's also important to be able to experiment, and having to always satisfy a type checker gets in the way of this experimentation. Another application is interoperability, where gradual typing would allow you to be optimistic about the types that you get from your database or deserialization API, um, while overall still working with a typed language. In scripting, you're stringing together a bunch of APIs. It's useful to have the type system be able to tell you about argument order or warn you about obvious mistakes. But you don't necessarily care about handling every corner case that, are, that is necessary for type safety. And in prototyping, the whole point is that you're just exploring what the shape of your program should be. And having to specify types right now is putting the cart before the horse. Now later, when your code has stabilized, 
it's useful to be able to add type annotations to get the additional optimizations and documentation. Um, so as you can see, in many applications of gradual typing, it actually makes sense to expect and take advantage of the fact that most code in the code, in the code base is typed, even if it is not the code that you're currently working on. Now that we made our first assumption, let's take advantage of it and by making a more concrete assumption, which is that all values know their most precise type. This does not only hold for simple and compound types, but also for higher order types. So from a user's perspective, if they want to write a lambda, what they'll need is to explicitly state that what interface that lambda is implementing. The correct interface depends on the context. Uh, but if we assume that we wrote this lambda as a custom comparator for sort, um, then it becomes clear that we need to declare that lambda to be a comparator. This is reasonable given that most of the code, in this particular case the standard list class, is typed. Of course it is still relatively restrictive and future work should soften this requirement somewhat. But for now we'll use it as it is, as it gives us an edge in efficiency. Now when we talk about efficiency and gradual typing, one thing that comes to mind is that a compiler should be able to use type annotations in order to produce more efficient code. So ideally the more type annotations we have, the faster our code should run. On the other hand, we noted that in order to protect the invariance of static typing from dynamic code, we need to have some runtime checks, especially when there's mixed code. So we might expect some bump in the middle um, where the overhead produced due to runtime checks cannot yet be balanced out by the uh, optimizations we get from types. So what do these checks usually look like? So in a system like type bracket, we have an arbitrary contact system which is implemented with functions and it just checks value at the boundary between typed and untyped code. That's relatively easy for primitive types like booleans, but when we get to higher order types like lambdas, it's undecidable whether an arbitrary function will always return a value of a certain kind. So we need to wrap it. We put it in a box that ostensibly fulfills all the requirements of the static type system. Now in the box, we have our original lambda and it still processes value and returns stuff. But we also have another guard that checks that the value that it returns has the type that we expected. And at some point, this might fail. And it might fail somewhere deeply in typed code. And at that point, from a user's perspective, it's kind of useless to tell them, ooh, your code failed here, deeply in typed code. So we need to point back to the location where the lambda originally entered typed code. So we need to put a blame label on the box to tell us where um, the lambda came from. And in fact, blame tracking in many other languages causes lots of overhead too. So how much overhead do we get? And here we get to uh, the Takikawa paper of 2016 where they tried to systematically measure how much overhead we get in gradual typing. And they found that this overhead is actually quite big. So how did they measure this? We divide up a program into a number of modules. We have a fully typed and a fully untyped version of each module. And then we can mix them all together to get all different configurations of a program and measure how long they take. So one example program is Sieve, which was specifically designed to demonstrate the pitfalls of gradual typing. So um, when we run this in typed record, we see that the fully typed version of the program is slightly faster than the fully untyped version. So that's great. But in the intermediate versions, we get lots of overhead. So in this case, in the original measurements, um, one of the configurations is more than 100 times slower than the fully untyped configuration. Now we tried to translate this program into norm and what we had to do there was add these um, type annotations to three lambdas that were in the program. And so, and so we see that in norm we get a faster typed version than an untyped version and also in the mixed cases we basically have no overhead. Uh, now C was created to demonstrate the pitfalls of gradual typing. And Takigawa et al measured several other programs and some of them were fine. But uh, one of them was Snake which basically implements the game that we all played on our cell phones years ago. So Snake consists of eight modules and that gives us 256 different configurations. So here we group them by the number of typed modules that we have. And we see again that in mixed cases there is a bunch of outliers um, where the overhead is about 100 times compared to the fully untyped code. But you also see that there's some programs that 
don't have that much overhead. And so you might think, well, let's just avoid the bad ones. But one thing, oops, but one thing Takikawa et al. found is that um, these overheads are unavoidable even if you're willing to annotate uh, multiple modules all at once. And in contrast, um, this program did not really contain any higher order values that were passed around, so it was relatively easy to translate to norm. And we see that we um, have, uh, again, the kind of uh, efficiency curve that we wanted. So um, how, how do we do that? Well, first, we implement our checks not as arbitrary functions in an arbitrary contact system, but specialize them in the runtime. And because of nominality, we can easily do that. So say um, there is Sam, the sneaky socket, and he wants to enter a typed code that expects a graph. Now, because we're in a nominal system, we know that Sam has a type tag that tells us that he's a socket. And we can use that information to uh, run a runtime subtyping check to see whether a socket is a graph. And because it isn't, we can sound the alarm and deny Sam access. And that's not only true for relatively simple values like sockets, but because we also restrict higher order values like that, Gus the Greedy Generator cannot enter code where that expects a comparator. The nominal type tag gives you deep information. Not only is Gus a function, but we know what kind of function he is. Now, if you compare this to the boxing approach, um, you see that if we don't use that, but our approach, we don't need to allocate any wrappers. We don't have any subsequent checks. If Gus is a correct function, then it can just run without any additional overhead. And we don't need any blame tracking because either this check fails right there or it never fails. So that is it for our comparison with Racket. Let's go back to our ideal efficiency graph. What we've seen one way, uh, what we've seen is one way to stray from this ideal, um, which is a bump in the middle of our ideal efficiency graph. Um, but another way to stray from the ideal is to have types decrease the performance of our program. And that is the case in reticulated Python, at least under its transient semantics. So here we have we use this baseline, the fully untyped version of a program, and see that in reticulated Python, the fully typed version is always slower than the fully untyped program, sometimes multiple times. Um, still, it's about five times, which is a lot better than the 100 times that we saw earlier. So, so that's great. And second, um, there is an additional advantage to the transient semantics, which is what's called open world soundness, which is the idea that outside code can arbitrarily mangle with your invariance. Now, norm does not defend against this. So that is, a, again, the design trade-off that we made. And so we are slightly faster in the untyped case again than the fully untyped case. OK. Again, our um, ideal efficiency graph. Now, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is what happens when untyped code is significantly slower than typed code. And here it's important to realize that there is no real numeric interpretation for the slope that we have. Um, it all depends a lot on context for whether we um, just did a really good job at uh, using types to optimize our code or did a really poor job at implementing our dynamic code. Now in C-sharp, it seems to be the latter. We also translated C to C-sharp, and what we see is that while in the fully typed case, it is about on par with the other languages, the fewer type annotations we have or the more dynamism is introduced, the slower the language gets, and that by a lot. And we see the same pattern in Snake, where again, we are about on par in the fully typed case, and it becomes increasingly slower as we add more dynamic types. And the reason for that is all the stuff that dynamic has to deal with in C-sharp. As an example, Consider this function eq that takes two dynamic values and applies the double equals operator on them. How should we implement this? Well, every value is an object. So um, we might therefore um, try to interpret the two values as objects. And in that case, double equals means reference equality. However, uh, we could call the function with two integers. And in C-sharp, double equals is actually an overloaded operator. What that means is that for uh, integers, double equals means value equality. So C sharp needs to know the runtime types of the arguments double equals in order to determine what implementation of it it should use. Furthermore, um, there are cases where static and dynamic arguments are mixed, and that prevents us from using efficient implementation techniques such as dynamic dispatching. 
This forces C sharp to defer compilation to runtime, where it knows precisely the types of the arguments and knows what overloading to search for. Um, this is not the only problematic case in C sharp, and the larger problem is that it doesn't have predictable semantics, in the sense that in C sharp, different type annotations for the same thing can cause vastly different behavior of the program. And therefore, which particular annotation is chosen makes a huge difference. Norm, on the other hand, satisfies a property known as the gradual guarantee, which roughly says that changes to the annotations of a gradually typed program should not change the behavior, the static or dynamic behavior of the program, at least so long as the annotations are correct. This also means that we can implement gradual typing naturally in the sense that statically typed parts can be implemented using techniques for statically typed languages and dynamically typed parts can be implemented using techniques for dynamically typed languages. So in NUM, this looks as follows. We have our objects, which are a record of a pointer to some meta information and a collection to uh, field values. Of course. The meta information con first contains all the things that you would expect from a standard object-oriented language like Java and c so there's a virtual method table and an interface lookup table for statically checked method calls. But in addition, it also contains a dynamic dictionary for dynamic accesses to fields and method, just as in a dynamically typed language. And the method lookup goes to a special intermediate method that checks the argument types and determines the appropriate overloading based on a pre-computed decision tree. This is an extension of the so-called mixed cast technique um, by Alenda et al. to overloading. Um, the gradual guarantee is important here because it tells us that this is easy to implement. There is at most one match we could find. And any valid static typing would also produce the same method call via a virtual method table lookup. But we don't have to do an expensive runtime reinterpretation of what the static type checker would do at compile time. So in summary, we tried to show the feasibility of gradual typing when integrated into the design process from the beginning such that all components of the type system uh, and the runtime implications can be considered. We implemented a gradually typed uh, nominal object-oriented language called NUM, and we showed that we can get good performance on benchmarks that so far have been problematic. Uh, we couldn't really exactly see the results for NUM on Snake before because it was so small on the bottom, so here it is. There's a quadratic fit that has the shape that we wanted. And if we compare all the data points to the fully untyped configuration, we can see a few that if only a few points um, are ever so slightly slower than the fully untyped configuration um, because of the slowdowns due to runtime checks. Overall, these overheads are always significantly smaller than in previous work, measured in percentages rather than multiples. So not only is our approach to gradual typing efficient and fulfills all desired formal properties of gradual typing, um, it is also useful in a variety of applications that we discussed, albeit not in every scenario where one might want gradual typing. And extending our reach here is a matter of future work. But in summary, um, as the core component of our checks is nominality, I hope you agree that sound gradual typing is nominally alive and well.